Tonight on Free Minds TV, it's now a crime to be hungry in Hungary. We'll also be getting into some tidbits from history, plus cigarettes, tonight on Free Minds TV. Welcome to episode 233 of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, is Toby. And Nick. We have a lot to be getting into, Nick. We are going to be talking about um, cigarettes um, in New York State, to be specific. A man who was arrested for having some untaxed cigarettes, some contraband there. Um, the black market of trafficking cigarettes. We we predicted it a number of years yeah, ago. Yeah, as the government drives up prices through taxes, yeah. I, I mean, there, there, there becomes a financial incentive to smuggle cigarettes, just like any product where there's an artificially high price created by government. And we'll be getting into that story in the latter half of the show, as well as Nick's tidbits in history. And there's a few interesting... It's a big week this week. Uh, I guess a few things, if I'm you sure. like history, it's very exciting. All sorts of stuff happened in history, but you've got a couple of special things you think people should uh, take remembrance of. But first, I want to talk about poor people, Nick. There's lots of poor people, many of them not watching this show because they're poor, too poor to have a computer or a TV to watch it on. But all you people who do have the leisure to watch it on television or get onto the internet and watch the show, you should probably think a little bit about what it's like to be, well, less fortunate on the street without a house. Well, some people have thought about it. And how should we solve that problem? Well. We'll make it illegal. Uh, we'll just make it illegal to be too poor to own a home. That'll solve the problem, right? We can drive them out by just saying, you know what? If you're too poor, we'll arrest you and put you in jail. That'll fix it, right? Well, that's what one country has done. Hungary, to be um, specific. Yeah, and I could get into a whole other thing about the, uh, you know, how government intervention has driven up, as you're pointing out, talking about being homeless has driven up the cost of attaining a home through things through programs designed to make home ownership more affordable. But I've done that before, I'll do it again. And this story from Hungary is probably more interesting to most of you. A new legal regulation has come into force in Hungary, making homelessness punishable by a fine of around $600 or prison. MPs from the ruling Conservative Party proposed the legislation on the grounds that Budapest could not cope with a large number of people on the streets. Uh, the Hungarian capital is said to have some 10,000 homeless people. Um, they're pointing out here that uh, there are shelters in place, but a lot of charities are criticizing this move, saying that even with the charity, uh, the, the shelters in place, um, about one to 3,000 people would still be homeless. There just aren't enough spaces for all of the homeless people in Hungary. And I don't know where the homeless people are going to get the money to pay the fine, Toby. Well, Finding are... homeless people for being homeless yeah. and, it seems kind of like what they used to do with putting people in prison when because they couldn't pay their debts. How are you supposed to pay your debts if you're in prison? It seems a, a lot to me that um, a lot of homeless people, at least the ones that I've run across, they don't usually have an extra $600 in their pocket. If they did, they wouldn't be on the street. Um, I guess there is a little bit of solace in this that they're going to give them a home, right? It'll be a home that they can't leave. They'll put them in jail. Well, they still have a roof over their head. Is, is yeah. that the idea? Um, right. Well, I mean, which yes, is going to probably this, well, be this much. This used to be done here in the U.S. I mean, in terms of actually arresting people for homelessness, vagrancy used to be an offense. Although, in many cases, its practical application was simply that homeless people went to jail during the winter months, so they didn't freeze to death. I don't really think a jail is the vehicle to provide housing. What's well, also much people. more expensive? It's much yeah. more expensive I'm, to put someone in jail than it is to, to give them a cot in a warm place, which sure. is really preferable to sleeping on. I mean, that's so really if, a big step up from the street. If they're saying in Hungary here that they just can't cope with a large amount of homeless people on the street, ten thousand of them, they can't cope with it. It's too many. It's it's too taxing to the citizens on taxpayers, um, having them in these shelters, whatnot. whatever their arguments are that it's too taxing on everybody to have 10,000 homeless people, well, how taxing is it going to be to house them all in a cage? It's going to cost a whole lot more. I really think that the real idea, and I think South Park made an episode or two about this, is to drive them to another spot. Say, well, we're going to make it a little difficult for you to live your life here in Hungary, so why don't you take your homelessness to some other governmental body? 
Right, or at least get it away from the, you know, we don't want that in the capital. I mean, if you look at the capital here in the U.S., I mean, Washington, D.C. is a, is really a terrible place. I mean, it's one of the, in terms of the crime rate, the poverty rates, um, you know, the quality of education, just the quality of life. For most of the residents of the District of Columbia, um, you know, who are not, you know, attached to the National Mall, not attached to those national institutions, um, it's really just one of the worst examples of what life in America can be. So, and that's caused a lot of embarrassment here. They, they've never cleaned it out. But I think there is that pressure. It's, it's not unique to the United States, Toby. I mean, I, I think the reaction in Budapest is, is much like the reaction in many other parts of the world where governments get embarrassed when uh, quite often the capital is not the most shining example of what, you know, a, a very functional or a very pleasant society. And I think in this case, their, their answer is, yeah, let's just drive the homeless people away from Budapest, which is the capital of Hungary. And, you know, maybe they'll, I don't know, go to smaller cities, go to the countryside, just stay out of sight. It's not, sight it's not even necessarily mind. they'll get rid of them. It's just maybe they'll go yeah. under bridges or they'll go yeah, live out in the subway. Sight, out of sight, out of mind. We don't want to, it's okay to be homeless, I guess, as long as we can't see you and be bothered by you smelly bums. Is that the, the idea here? That's, yeah, I think, I think largely that is the idea with legislation like this. Because everybody and knows there's not a single thinking, breathing person out there that really thinks that you can just outlaw being homeless and that'll fix the problem, right? It, it, there, people don't really believe, I hope. I'm sure there are a few of you out there, but I'm, I'm hoping the majority of people don't actually believe that you can outlaw being homeless and that'll fix the problem. Most homeless people don't want to be homeless. It's not a choice that they would choose to do if they were able to have a home. Well, and at least here in the United States, I mean, a big part of the homelessness problem is there are mental health issues that typically, it's not just that people are poor, although certainly some people just fall on hard times and they do end up on the street. But when you look at people who are chronically homeless, far and away disproportionately, they tend to be people uh, with mental health problems or with substance abuse problems. Um, just simply putting them in jail or harassing them doesn't really right. address those underlying problems. So then I start to think, everybody knows this that's passing this type of legislation. They know that making it a crime isn't going to actually fix the problem. It's just going to push it underground, push it away. Why aren't they more honest about it? It seems like everybody, they, the people who are passing these laws, they know what they're doing, but it seems a little bit like it's like trickery. Uh, they're they're not being honest about what they're really doing, and, it, and that just bothers me. And it's not only in Hungary that they do this; they do this in various pockets of the United States as well. As more homeless people hit the streets, it's become, becoming a problem to different governments around here as well. I have a story coming from Florida, where 13 of 16 people arrested on Tuesday on charges of violating the new road safety ordinance pleaded guilty in court today. Judge Thomas uh, Designer sentenced them to time served. In a Blitz Escoma County, Florida deputies Tuesday, um, 16 people were charged with violating the county's new ordinance targeting panhandling. Deputies began enforcing the er uh, ordinance early Tuesday afternoon at various intersections in the county, including several along Davis Highway. The ordinance prohibits people from standing in medians of roadways holding signs and stepping into the road to ret uh, ret uh, retrieve donations. Um, Escombia County Sheriff's Office spokesman Sergeant Mike Ward said the effort went very well. Obviously, they weren't happy about being arrested, but we received no physical resistance. It's good, I suppose. A conviction can carry a fine of up to $500 and a jail sentence of up to 60 days. Um, we made an effort to educate people, and from this point, they're going to be subject to arrest, the uh, sheriff spokesman said. Soon after the ordinance passed, deputies began informing panhandlers of the new law, passing out copies of the ordinance along with information packets on agencies that can provide for the poor. Well, even with the arrests going on, it did not stop the panhandling. Just have, as soon as the uh, deputies left, panhandlers return, returned to the median, standing um, standing right where they were. Uh, the sheriffs were just a few few minutes before. One man said that he uh, planned on continuing the panhandling despite the ordinance. I'm hungry. I have no other choice, he said. So, okay, I see where they're coming from. It can create a danger to have them on the highway here. But arresting them for it, 
is not going to fix the problem. And it also makes you question how much money are they going to be spending on arresting these individuals and then taking them to jail, putting them through the court process. They're not going to be having money for the fine. They're poor. They're out begging for money. Um, what are they actually, what's the hope here? That you're just going to make it so difficult and keep on arresting them and spending lots of money that they'll go somewhere else? I mean, that's what they're doing. They've, they've given up on getting jobs. And like you said, many of them have mental issues. And they're deciding to beg for money on the side of the road. They say, we'll make this illegal. It's going to be very costly and enforced. It's also not right. realistic. Well, As here, after they arrested 16 people, a few minutes after the deputies left, well, yeah, if you're homeless, people you're, flooded you're, back you're in. find a way to eat somehow, right? And whether that's panhandling, whether that's stealing money, whether that's eating food out of, I mean, it, it happens, whether it's eating food out of trash cans. Uh, I, I think if you actually look at the policy, the, the behavior that it incentivizes, um, by maybe making panhandling a less appealing option, do you want people eating out of trash cans and just acting as vectors for infectious disease? Uh, do you want people stealing as opposed to just asking you to give them a little bit of yes. money? Um, I mean, if you're homeless and you're hungry, yeah, there may be these options available. I mean, a lot of times well, when we read shrinking. stories like this, they are, they are, They're shrinking very quickly. Right. State budgets are being cut all over Private for Private charities for don't get as much services. in the way of donations because right. it's down people everywhere. are not giving their money away. There are people are, who would typically donate are concerned yeah. about their own finances. Food pantries are, they're, they're, pantries right. are bare. They're, they, every single week I see and hear news reports that they, even the charities that really used to be able to help people out just don't have it. Um, we have this whole conservative rash of cutting health and human services, which I can understand in a sense, but if you're true, truly your goal is to be conservative here, it costs way more money because what ends up happening is the court systems get overburdened. Um, the jails, the jails, you know, the number one in the United States, the number one mental health care provider in the United States are U.S. prisons. That's very costly so yeah, well that's, that's it kind doesn't of thing. save they, money to cut these cut services the, right they've cut the cost as far as um, mental health services they have they've they've cut the services to save costs but in effect what the government is now doing what the state governments and, and loca local municipalities are doing is that they've said well we're not going to provide mental health services we're just going to arrest the crazy people when they inevitably eventually act up. Right, so then and you have then a victim. We'll them, right. And then well, it, it's, potentially. I mean, a lot of times they're not arrested for a crime with a victim. Well, a lot of the time they are. Breaking and entering, I mean, a, a large part of those. They might, yeah, but they might just be you know, defecating publicly or... Uh, or robbing people. You know, running about in traffic forget, or things like that. I mean, when that makes people, kind of like, like, when but people, that does happen. But when the health and human services are cut, happening. these people who have mental health issues, they get off their medication, and then they can become dangerous to others in society. So, I mean, it's a difficult question. What do you do? I mean, coming from a libertarian perspective, what are you supposed to do in this situation? I mean, there's a lot of people out there that say, turn to charities. Well, charities aren't, they're not fall, um, pulling through right now. So what do you do next? Some people out there would say, well, you simply let the Second Amendment take care of it. To me, it's kind of harsh, Nick. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, uh, these people are largely taking care of themselves, I mean, to a point, not very well. But they're keeping themselves alive at this point. The effort to criminalize... About behavior, as well as a stray dog. Right. Stray dogs live. I mean, they're there. So, I mean, they're taking care of themselves to a point. The effort to criminalize somebody being down on their luck or having a tough time, going through a bad period in their life... Um, I don't really get that if they're not causing harm to other people. Somebody panhandling, I mean, homelessness is certainly not an attractive option no matter where you are. It is a lot more common in places like Florida, California, where it's warm all the time mm -hmm. and you can basically just beg for money. You don't really have to worry about a winter that's going to kill you and things like that. I mean, there are people who are legitimately, I mean, homeless by choice to, to an extent. I mean, they probably still have their issues. Um, but I think it's a little bit different in places like Florida. You've got sure. people who are homeless. If you want to live on the street and yep. beg for money, um, if you don't have to do either, either you're doing it because you have to, or if you don't have to do that, well, you've chosen a very interesting lifestyle and one that, frankly, seems awfully tough. But if, uh, you know, if 
I don't know, living in an alley or something or you know, a makeshift shelter in the woods and begging for money at the intersection is how you want to live your life. Um, I suppose as long as you're not hurting anybody. I don't have a huge problem with that. Wouldn't recommend it. You know, I am curious, Nick. Uh, I know that we have a lot of uh, what volunteerists or anarchists who watch the show and a lot of people from more of this libertarian perspective. Um, I am curious, if anyone wants to contact us, go to our website, freemindstv.com. From there, there's a contact page and email in what some solutions are. What, what solutions do you suggest for the mentally ill? People the Second who, Amendment one isn't very good. No, it's really not. And that's what I've heard before is the Second Amendment. And that is not a very good argument. You're not going to sway many people that way. Oh, what's your solution? I've heard the charity argument as well, but guess what? It's not working. And then they say, well, the government's taking all these tax dollars. Well, to a certain extent, too. But you know what? If the government cut my taxes by half, I still wouldn't have a lot of money to be giving towards people with mental illness. I mean, the federal government, to be honest with me, I know I complain that they take my taxes, but I usually get most of that back at the well, at, at collection time. I so a lot of people really aren't taxed as much as they claim right. to be. Well, locally, we do and have some pretty good solutions in place. I mean, we do have a cold weather shelter that's, as far as I understand, they might receive some grant money, but they're, they're privately funded. We have a food kitchen that's privately funded and does locally. We have both well, partially and surrounding privately area. funded. Yeah, I mean, they all receive money from some, governments. Yeah, they do. And they would not function without that right now. Yeah. They completely I I would. Think the, I think the King Community Kitchen would be okay. Okay, well, if, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the bottom line... We have line, a good economy locally, so right. yeah. It's, they haven't been stress tested in the way that, say, sure. a food kitchen in Detroit or... Los Angeles probably has been during the downturn. So I want to know your solutions. Please send them in. Love to hear it. Freemindstv.com is the address. Go to the contact page. Let us know what you think we should do. And don't just tell me charity. Don't just tell me Second Amendment. Explain how that's going to work in a depressed economy. I want to know. I think it's important. Or do we just say survival of the fittest? Is that? I know there, there's a lot of people who believe in that as well. I'm, I'm curious what people think. Because um, it is an interesting perspective from the libertarian standpoint. I know we have this whole mantra of charity, 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 but right. Okay, it's not working. All right, um, we do have some stuff to move on. Nick's history lesson today. Some important dates you want people to know yeah. about. Well, December fifth, uh, which both of these will have passed by the time uh, the show airs, but they're happening on the week we're filming it. So December fifth was repeal day, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution repealed a previous amendment that had put alcohol prohibition into place and suddenly many parts of the country were no longer dry. So that was good. We recognized that prohibition was a failed experiment, which it was. It led to a lot of black market violence, a lot of unintended consequences, people being poisoned by things like bathtub gin. Of course, the country didn't, you know, completely turn the, you know, turn the taps back on. Um, you know, certain certain parts of the country are still dry to this day. Certain counties, certain states, um, but well, I don't think there's any dry states. Utah is pretty close to a dry state. They make it hard for you to drink. But different states have their different laws. But prohibition, that mindset, that approach to alcohol, that's when it changed course. And uh, some people have referred to it as a noble experiment, but it was one that clearly failed. Um, unfortunately. I think a lot of people lost the lesson that you need an amendment to regulate a substance across the entire country. There's no constitutional amendment giving them the power to regulate narcotics, and yet they do it without that constitutional authority. Clearly, back during the days of alcohol prohibition, they thought they needed to give themselves that authority. If they thought they had it anyway, they wouldn't have bothered to ratify an amendment to put alcohol prohibition into place and then to remove it. But there was a bit more respect for that whole constitutional framework. And of course, December 7th uh, were, is, um, well, a lot of people don't remember as clearly. Um, December 7th was the day that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and this year would actually be the 70th anniversary of that. So the start of World War II, at least as far as the U.S. is concerned, uh, was 70 years ago this week. Um, and I think the, the important lesson to take out of that, um, I know there are a lot of people out there, um, especially in the libertarian movement, who uh, are so anti-war that they condemn the U.S.'s role in World War II somehow, which I frankly don't get, and I frankly have never agreed with. 
But what I think is interesting is if you actually look back a little bit further and actually look at the reasons why World War II happened in the first place, why the circumstances arose that allowed it to happen, it has everything to do with U.S. involvement in World War I, it has everything to do with Woodrow Wilson getting the U.S. involved in Europe. And that was the start. It's significant because that was the start of this mentality that the United States should be the policeman of the world and should make the world safe for democracy and should fight a war to end all wars, should fight for these, these overarching themes around the globe, you know, peace and democracy and freedom. Well, really what it led to was a peace treaty that led to the rise of the Nazis. And frankly, I think if it had not been for Wilson's intervention in World War I, and I don't know if there are too many people out there who would dispute this, had it not been for Wilson's intervention in World War I, it's very likely that the Holocaust never would have happened, Nazism never would have rose to prominence in Germany, that World War II as we know it never would have happened. So that was one of the, the earliest and the most stark examples and historians are now really considering those two just different parts of the same conflict. But it's one of the most stark examples of how the United States goes around the world, meddles in other people's business, because we really didn't have any reason to be involved in World War I. And I think it's questionable whether we should have backed the British or the Germans, if you actually look at how, think, how the world was back then, if you really cared about freedom and democracy. Um, so it was really the first example of the United States creating these problems and those problems coming back to bite us. And they came back to bite us on December 7th and then another world war kicked off, one of the most costly wars in human history. So I think it's, uh, it's just important to remember those things, Toby. Two important lessons from yeah. history that I think are often overlooked. It is interesting to think about in that perspective, say World War um, I hadn't happened, we didn't get involved in it. Therefore, World War II The British didn't Empire happen. might have ended a couple decades it earlier. It makes you wonder what this country would have looked like because then the United States at that time was carrying out its own version of the Holocaust right. with the eugenics program, which got halted with World War II. <laughs> so maybe it would have gone down a completely different Well, and that was the thing. And, and I'm not going to say Wilson specifically, because I don't have any sources in front of me. And while that is my impression, I can't back it up. But a lot of people who ran in w Wilson's circles, his political circles, his ideological circles, were proponents of eugenics. And it was really American eugenicists who pioneered the idea uh, you know, of a state-run eugenics program. That's what you know, the Nazis actually looked to the United States for a lot of that source material, a lot of yeah, that start started. to their ideas. It was from Americans and Britons who had come up with these ideas of eugenics. It wasn't a German creation. It was really something that, you know, the United States at one point was a eugenics leader in the world. Um, Thankfully, that's fallen out of favor, and especially well, it fell out of favor after the Holocaust. The yeah, as soon as the, the Germans U took it to the next level. Some U.S. states were still still performing sterilizations. Up, I mean, of course, we had the sterilization model, not the uh, gas chamber model. But some states were still performing sterilizations up until the 1970s. I mean, it's not ancient history. No. Um, and it was in all the states adopted different eugenics At, at laws, one point, so. other New Hampshire had a yeah. program, Vermont. Louisiana, California, everybody had a eugenics program. It was in vogue. And that's really where, you know, that, that idea, that concept that really gave the Nazis their start, it started here in the United States. And it probably would have gone a lot further if the Nazis hadn't come into power and really had shown just the whole how idea. awful it, right. it, it was. Because they took it to the right. next logical conclusion, well, which, if you go back and read some of the history on eugenics, a lot of the people say, well, I get the sterilization is good, but what about this generation? What do we do th with this generation? And that's where Hitler said, well, we put them in a gas chamber, and then everybody said, oh, that's, let's back off. That's that. just a little too much. <laughs> a I mean, too we just much. wanted to sterilize people so they couldn't breed, and they'd go extinct over the period of a couple generations. We do it with cattle. Why not people, <laughs> right? That's the argument. That was the rationale. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's interesting to just think about what ifs in history, the butterfly effect. One little thing could change. Well, yeah, and that, that's the thing. When we talk about these interventions going on today, do we really know what that's going to do oh, down the line? Because, I mean, I suppose anything could have happened, but the world could be a much better place if we had not gotten involved in World War II. Or worse, who knows? Or, I mean, World War I. I don't think it would have been World War II as, as we think of it today. So many what Maybe not a Cold War. Maybe not the Soviet Union that lasted. It's true. Well, some things are predictable. One thing that's predictable is when governments uh, create a black market on something, such as alcohol prohibition, 
it drives, drives prices up and makes people go underground to get that product. Very clear in prohibition, uh, with the prohibition of alcohol, that that's what happens. Um, there's also gray markets where items are legal, but they're taxed high, and people try to go around the taxes um, to get out of paying some of them. And we predicted that that would happen with tobacco um, as governments continue to uh, pump up those taxes, and it, and it has. Um, at first, they were going after some of the big guys. Now they're going after some of the smaller time people who are what the government calls defrauding them out of billions of dollars worth of taxes every single year. This is coming from New York where tro troopers operating a sobriety checkpoint Friday night at the Maydale Thruway exit charged a man with possession of untaxed cigarettes, a misdemeanor, after they noticed he had a carton filled with nearly 30 cartons of cigarettes in his car. Jeffrey S. Smith, 41, uh, was also charged with aggravated unlicensed operation of a motor vehicle. Troopers said that Smith had 29 cartons of cigarettes, which he claimed that he bought from an Indian reservation near Buffalo. So probably not going to smoke all those cigarettes himself. Probably was a small-time distributor. Um, but uh, I'm not surprised. We said it would happen, and it happened. Yeah, and this is a, this. Is, we've read similar stories before. This does happen in New York a lot because they do have some some pretty sizable Indian reservations there, and very high taxes. And on very cigarettes. high taxes on cigarettes, which is why there's such an incentive to. All right, well, I guess I'll drive out to the United Nation and buy some buy some untaxed cigarettes because the price difference makes it profitable to you know drive a pretty good distance for 30 cartons of cigarettes, which isn't really that much. I mean, we're talking about you know, a large box of cigarettes, but it's not like you're filling a tractor trailer with, with these cigarettes. Which some profit, people do. Right. There I mean, are big times oh, dealers yeah, oh, out yeah. there that are filling tractor trailers. This is, two, in New York alone, they estimate they lose $2 billion a year oh, yeah, from people got, running black market cigarettes. We've got untaxed cigarettes coming in from Mexico now. I mean, it's, um, it's predictable because once there's enough of a, really once there's enough of a premium on these products, it becomes lucrative. Yeah. Number one, it becomes lucrative as a consumer to do an end run around the law and buy the untaxed cigarettes because you're saving money. Even if you're, there's a markup, some money going to that middleman, that smuggler, you can still make out better than if you're giving that money to the state as a middleman. And it becomes profitable for these people running the cigarettes. I mean, yep. if you can make $20 on a carton of cigarettes and you can run you know, 40 or 50 of them, that adds up pretty quick. Especially in a tight economy, you might not be able to find work, but you can shuttle cigarettes back and forth. I think it's important to point out, just to highlight the black market principles, how it works. You either tax something to, out of um, into the black market, or you can make it illegal and it'll go into the black market. You're not going to prohibit it, though. You it's can't really, keep it's drugs just out of prison. Yeah. It's, just, I mean, it's, real, it's really just economic principles at work. We're out of time for tonight. FreeMindsTV.com. Until next week, have a great night.